Welcome to the deep dive series by Advocata Institute. This is a forum in which we take an in-depth look at the biggest policy issues facing our country. In preparation of the upcoming panel discussion titled How Can We Improve Debt Sustainability in Sri Lanka? This is the second of our three primers. It is titled Overview of Fiscal Performance and Policies. So, let us begin by definitions. What is fiscal policy? It is the use of government revenue collection and expenditure to influence a country's economy. Fiscal dominance is defined as an economic condition that occurs when a country has a large government debt like Sri Lanka and deficits such that monetary policy targets keeping the government from bankruptcy as opposed to economic targets such as inflation, growth and employment. Fiscal multiplier. It is the ratio of change in national income arising from change in government spending. Fiscal impulse, the change in government budget balance resulting from a change in government expenditure and tax policies. And finally, profligacy is a continued unsustainable fiscal position. Let us look at tax policy. It is a choice by the government as to what taxes to levy in what amounts and on whom. A progressive tax system is based on an individual's ability to pay. Low income earners are taxed at a lower rate while high income earners are taxed higher. Example, income taxes are based on a bracket. A regressive tax system is one where individuals disproportionately who have lower income pay higher taxes. What is a tax expense? It is an expenditure or a special provision of the tax code such as exclusions, deductions, deferrals, credits or tax rates that benefit specific activities or groups of taxpayers. Tax subsidy is a reduction of the tax burden granted to certain businesses or industry for particular consumption or production. And a tax credit is a defined absolute benefit that can be set off against one's taxes. So, again some further definitions. The concept of a primary balance, it is the difference between government revenue and non-interest expenditure. The, the indication of a primary balance is a good way to judge a budget, because interest is what you pay on accumulated debt. The revenue is what resources you collect in a given year and how you spend it on primary expenditure. And the overall balance takes the primary balance and deducts the interest. This is what is commonly understood in Sri Lanka. So, what is the problem? Well, this is an illustration of primary balances over the last 60 odd years. We, to illustrate better, we have color coded it with the colors of different governments. And as you can see that across the ages, across different political parties, across different finance ministers, we have been posting continuous fiscal balance deficits. And they have only been four circumstances in which we have posted primary balance surpluses. The first two were back in 1954 and 1955 during the Korean war when we had a there was a huge boom in commodity prices and therefore, the government who was taxing commodity exports was able to sustain high revenues which were used to offset expenditure. And the only other instance since the mid 1950s was a couple of years ago, one a marginal balance in 2017 and a, a balance ranging between 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 percent of GDP in 2018. This got reversed in 2019 due to the Easter bombings and it is expected that this year that we have a broad primary deficit because of the COVID-19 situation. As you can see that this behavior is endemic to Sri Lanka. This seems to be built into our character and the word fiscal conservatism is non-existent. 
we took the same data and overlaid it relative to various parts of the civil conflicts that have affected this country and we have shown the JBP insurrections, the various Elam wars that happened over a period of 20 years and the JVP insurrection, the second JVP insurrection. And you can see that there is some pattern that these fiscal balances did blow out during specific periods when activity magnified. So, has the electoral system or the electoral cycle contributed to fiscal profligacy? We detail on the left hand side uh, various promises made at election time. Famously, Lee Kuan Yew had told President Jaya Jayawardena that Sri Lankan elections are an auction of non existing resources. So, famously, in 1970, Sri Ramana Bandaranaika said, even if we have to bring rice from the moon, we will bring it. More recently, in 2015, the UNP government that came into power promised to increase the salaries of public sector ser servants by 10,000 rupees. That promise alone cost in excess of 120 billion because there is about 1.2 million civil servants in Sri Lanka. More recently, at the presidential election that was concluded at the end of last year, the incumbent president promised to increase uh, salaries of plantation workers by a thousand rupees and that was counteracted by his opponent Sajid Premadasa to increase it to 1500. The current president also promised to increase to, to give fertilizer free. Now, what does academic research find on the electoral cycle and the electoral system? Well, there are studies by Bataglini that show that proportionate electoral systems suffer from a deficit bias compared to first past the post system. Now, Sri Lanka has a mixed system, it is like a Gaulish system. Then we have that proportionate systems accumulate more debt than first past the post. Presidential systems, the pure presidential system, we have a mixed system, a Gaulish system, generally tend to have lower fiscal deficits and lower debt. And parliamentary systems generally that run larger fiscal deficits during recessions tend to maintain that going forward. So, let us look at it relative to the region that in terms of the overall balance, we are an outlier. We have posted very large fiscal deficits even in periods where we have been trying to consolidate the primary balance because we have so, so much of inherited debt. But if you can look with regard to some peers in the region, their deficits are significantly lower than us except for India our close neighbor. So, where lies the problem? As this graph will clearly show you that 20 years ago, we were collecting close to 20 percent of GDP in terms of revenue. That has significantly declined over the last 20 years to around 13 percent, except for a few years ago when there was a heightened effort to increase it. And revenue has pretty much stayed the same, although that is also on a declining trend, the expenditure, the primary expenditure. And this behavior has contributed to the primary balances which you see at the bottom. So, how, what, what are the consequences of a government running deficits? Well, the concept of a revenue deficit is to look at the revenue minus recurrent expenditure which includes interest and interest is a large component. So, as you can see in the first graph, 
the pig shows government deceiving and over a long period of time we have been deceiving and this government deceiving is reducing the domestic saving by the private sector and this deceiving invariably contributes to the current account deficit because the current account deficit is the investment in the economy minus savings. And as you can see in the third graph, this shows you uh, what the funding deficit on our current account is and this is simply the current account deficit with foreign direct investment which is already in the country or new foreign direct investment that is coming in which mainly is reinvestment of existing profits. So, the pink in the third graph shows you how much every year has to be funded from overseas and part of this funding is due to this government disaving. So, let us look at revenue. Now, this shows you on the left hand side a chart of how our revenue performance has been over the last few years and last year it went down although there were some efforts a few years ago to increase it and we had a very large shock going into the economy which significantly affected discretionary spending and therefore, revenue was affected. Except for poorer countries like Bangladesh, most of our regional peers collect significantly higher amount of revenue than we do. But if you look at us relative to expenditure as a share of GDP, we are actually doing a lot better than our regional peers. So, in conclusion on the matter of how this primary balance is getting generated, it is mainly an issue of declining revenue rather than excessive spending. So, this is the trend in absolute terms of revenue over the years and with the economy expanding a decade ago, the revenue also increased, but relative to the size of the expansion, the revenue did not keep up. And as you can see in the graph on the bottom, it shows you this declining trend. The dark purple is the revenue that has been collected from taxes and the gray is from non-taxes mainly dividend payments from SOEs and transfers from the central bank and some fees that are collected. This shows you a composition of where this tax revenue and revenue is collected. As you can see that 75 percent or close to 75 percent of total revenue is collected from indirect taxes and it is a only a mere 25 percent which actually has gone up since lately after the introduction of the new inland revenue act in 2017, but still it is significantly low relative to indirect taxes. Now, indirect taxes are generally considered to be more regressive that because it is applied on consumption goods, uh, the wealthier households consumption is not generally significantly higher than poorer households and therefore, the burden relative to one's income is significantly more in the poorer households than the richer households and income based taxes account for only a mere 24 percent of total revenue. So, from a paper written by Professor McMoor, we have extracted a table that compares the composition of revenue from the colonial era during 1938 to 39 with the average in the last decade. And you can see that the main source of revenue in both periods have been taxes on imports. Income taxes basically have been 15 percent this was only a few years after the introduction of the Inland Revenue Authority in the early 1930s and it is now about 19 percent, but used to be lower previously. And the excise taxes on liquor and tobacco interestingly has remained the same 
and the social security contribution again pretty similar. More recently uh, revenue has been collected through VAT and uh, there used to be surpluses through various government entities, but that is now mainly a deficit because of the large losses earned by the SOEs cumulatively. So, what is the composition of import taxes? And this illustrates the various taxes that have been applied to imported commodities. This shows you in comparison the taxes that are imposed on domestic based taxes. So, these are mainly goods that are goods and services manufactured and delivered within the country. And this shows you the composition of income based taxes. And very interestingly, you can see the significant increase in 2019 from income based taxes. And this is primarily due to the new inland revenue code that came in 2017 and perhaps also the Ramis computer system that improves compliance. So, the tax buoyancy effect is to see that uh, how taxes total tax collection responds to changes in economic growth and this chart illustrates uh, the relationship between economic growth and total taxes that are collected. And you can see that in most years the tax buoyancy the rate of change of taxes collected does not keep up with economic growth. So, what perhaps explains this? One, one reason could be that most of the faster growing parts of the economy, the higher contributors to economy probably have, has a lower incident of taxation and therefore, these growing sectors are not paying their fair share of taxes. So, let us look at some issues in tax policy and administration. Towards the end of last year after the change in government, large number of changes were made to tax policy. The first was the VAT rate was reduced from 15 percent to 18 percent and it was effective 1st December. The threshold on VAT which used to be 1 million per month was increased to 25 million and they automatically deregistered a large number of people who were registered but subsequently they were allowed to re-register again because if you are not registered for VAT you do not get the benefit of input credit and your output credit also cannot be uh, taken into account by somebody who buys your goods. The NBT the nation building tax which is a cascading tax normally about 2 percent was also abolished. The debt repayment levy which was 7 percent on value addition in financial services, the same basis of the financial VAT uh, was eliminated. So, the burden on banks who had a tax burden of something close to 52 percent has come down now to 40 percent because the income tax rates also have been reduced. The personal income tax rates, the threshold was increased to 3 million. But all sources of income are now taxable including interest income and there are three rates 6 percent, 12 percent and 18 percent and the threshold starts at 3 million. There were also withholding taxes that is collecting taxes at source. The concept of withholding tax was done away with and the corporate tax rate across the board the highest marginal rate which was at 28 percent has been reduced to 24 percent. For manufacturing companies it's reduced to 18 percent, for liquor, tobacco and gaming it remains at 40 percent. Construction was reduced from four, four, 28 to 14 and for information technology companies it was completely excluded. So, we did a analysis of a firm over a 20 years and the firm has revenues of 100 million rupees and another firm 
that has revenues of 50 million rupees 20 years ago. And we took a constant tax rate, a profit rate and we computed the amount of taxes that this theoretical firm would have to pay and calculated an effective tax rate. And as you can see that over this period of time, the effective rate of taxation has come down. And for a smaller firm, it came down and then it seems to have gone up. So, we looked at how we tax indirect taxes and this shows you a comparison of some very highly taxed items and some high taxation. So, alcohol has one of the highest rates of taxes relative to its cost, it is close to 475 percent. Cigarettes are taxed at about 325 percent, motor cars one of the highest tax rates in the world over 150 percent for a mid size engine car and a smaller car it is about 125 percent and we tax petrol at about 125 percent at the current prices. If you import chocolates, imported chocolates are taxed at 90 percent and ceramic items because of large tariff protection for domestic producers is also taxed at 90 percent. This is the total taxes and tariffs. Diesel is taxed at 65 percent that is because the retail prices were not changed and uh, steel is taxed at 40 percent again to protect local manufacturers. So, in terms of indirect taxes, most of the taxation is extremely high. Now, this details these recent tax changes, how they have impacted VAT, which is generally considered a much more efficient way of taxing, because there is no cascading effect in value added taxes that you have the benefit of input credit. And this shows you that over the last decade, that there have been number of changes that it initially was in excess of 15 percent, then it was brought down to 12 percent, then it went down to 11 percent, then it went up to 15 percent and then it came down recently now to 8 percent. And interestingly, uh, what the bar at the bottom shows you is a threshold, the minimum threshold for registration, it used to be 15 million and then it was brought down to 12 million which with the intention of expanding the tax net, but now it has been increased to 300 million and this threshold is not based on value added which is the way to do better way to do it, but it is based on revenue. So, if you are a trading business 300 million rupees is not a lot of money, but if you are a service business 300 million in revenues is a large amount of money. And we have made these drastic changes on VAT, which accounts for over 25 percent of revenue collection. So, this is a major change on a major tax component. So, let us have a look at tax subsidies. Now, tax subsidies is a tax expense for the government, and they are generally defined at either a concession or a rate of tax that is lower than what you tax everything else in the economy. So, we did a synthesis on the role that capital allowances pay in managing taxes. So, this was a hotel investment and it synthesized that there was an initial investment of a billion rupees and there was a certain asset structure and the hotel was totally funded with equity and took some assumptions of its growth rate. And we tried it with 28 percent versus 14 percent and an investment when, when this investment is taxed at 14 percent, it has an IRR of 10.8 percent, while if it is taxed at 28 percent 
its IRR comes down to 8.4 percent. So, one way of thinking about tax policy is to say that if a particular investment cannot reach its hurdle rate of return, if the returns to society are higher than private returns, then there is some merit in some tax subsidy and a tax subsidy is in the form of a lower rate of taxation, because if tourists are coming to a country and the primary driver of their decision is the cost of a hotel room or one of the key decisions and they have a lot of non-hotel spending, then it makes sense to, to push investment over their hurdle rate, build the hotel rooms, attract tourists into the country and try to capture taxes from other activity that happens. Now, we, we are very fortuitous that we are in a great location at the apex, the southern apex of India and we are ideally suited for port services. If so, why are we giving concessionary rates of taxation for port services? The second comment is if you if you are a construction firm and if you construct a building, the rate of tax on those profits are going to be 14 percent, but for the components that go into the building, the tax rate is 18 percent. That does not make sense to me. Now, Google and Microsoft after the recent tax changes in the US they pay 21 percent of their profits in taxes, but Sri Lanka the IT companies are completely exempt from paying taxes. Now, I do not understand the rationale or logic of that and this shows you taxes on fuel over a long period of time. The series on top is the taxes that are paid on petrol and the series at the bottom are the taxes that are charged on diesel. Except for the more recent period where the price of oil came down, over the years we have made a conscious decision to tax diesel at a significantly lower rate than petrol or other goods. Generally, most finished goods are taxed at 60 percent at the border, those that do not have a cess. But as you can see that for a number of years, the total taxation on diesel was a mere 15 percent and this is a single largest import. So, what is the logic of taxing it so low? I do not understand. And we looked at also taxation on individuals over a 20 year period. So, we ran three scenarios. In the first scenario, somebody starts working 20 years ago and they are earning 100,000 rupees a month, which is about 1.2 million a year, and they have 5 million in fixed deposits. And we took that 5 million and we compounded the interest at the average weighted deposit rate, fixed deposit rate and then we took his wages and increased it by inflation plus 2 percent for real wage increase. And the gray line shows you his total income and the purple is the amount of taxes that he has paid. And the top chart, the pink line shows you the effective tax rate. So, when he started his career, his income was slightly less than 2 million rupees. Now, his income is about 9 million rupees, but his tax rate, effective tax rate, which was about 22 percent, has now declined to about 7 percent. Then we took a slightly higher wagered who started his career at 200,000 and he had little bit higher endowment 10 million and we ran the same numbers through the various tax rates 
and tax policies over the ages. And even in that person's case that his initial effective tax rate was about 26 percent and now it has declined to about 17 percent. And it is only in the third scenario where somebody did not have any wages, but was fairly endowed they had a large uh, fixed deposits of 400 million when they started. And for that person his tax burden went up. Historically we, we exempted interest as part of assessable income, there was a withholding tax which was the final tax and it is to be set at a rate of 10 percent and then it was reduced to 5 percent. But lately the withholding tax or all withholding taxes were taken away and interest income is part of assessable income. So, if you are earning at a higher level of income then at the margin interest income will be taxed at 18 percent. So, we also looked at comparison of our tax policy with some other countries and the graph on the left hand side shows you uh, the income tax bands and that shows you the highest income tax band and the pink line at the bottom on the chart on the left hand side shows you the tax free threshold. Now, the tax free threshold has significantly been increased recently to 3 million. So, anybody earning an income below total income below 3 million rupees is exempt from taxes. And the chart on the right hand side basically shows you the tax free thresholds of some comparative countries. Now, we took Thailand, Singapore, India, Australia. Interestingly, amongst these countries, some of them whose per capita incomes are significantly higher than us, our tax free threshold is higher than all these countries. And when you look at it relative to per capita income, the tax free threshold in Sri Lanka is almost three times higher than our per capita income, indicative that significant amount of the population is exempted from paying income taxes, while the scenario is significantly different especially in the wealthier countries. Now, let us move on to tax administration, because you can have the best tax policy in the world, but unless you have an efficient tax administration your ability to collect taxes is impaired. So, there are three departments, the first is the customs, it is one of the oldest revenue departments as I showed you that in Mick Moore's research paper that in the 1930s it is through the customs that a bulk of the taxes were co collected even during the colonial era it was trade taxes that comprise a majority of revenue that customs was set up in 1806 and they collect uh, close to 900 billion in 2019 of approximately about 1.7 billion that was collected. And the cost of collection is about only a quarter percent. The inland revenue department collects about 900 billion which is about 46 percent of total tax collection. And the excise department also collects a substantial amount of revenue mainly through taxes on liquor and tobacco, but there is also excise taxes on vehicles. So, this shows you some statistics of how many taxpayers there are in the country. So, in terms of corporate taxpayers there is about 53,000 and in terms of non corporate there is about 250,000 tax files and about 664,000 pay tax payers. Now, remember that 
pays a form of withholding tax and all withholding taxes have been taken away. So, those 664,000 people who previously were paying pay tax have now to file returns. So, there were about 250,000 individuals who had tax files and amongst the payee probably many of these individuals are included. So, it is almost a threefold increase in the number of individuals who have to file tax returns. In terms of other payers, there is about 26,000 people who are registered for VAT and a significant number of them got deregistered because they were below the 300 million threshold, but many of them re-registered. So, as you can see in this that the number of people who are by law having to pay taxes is quite small. Our, our labor force is about 8.4 million on a population on an economically active population of about 15 million. So, the coverage of direct taxes is fairly low, but we do not even have taxes on land and perhaps policy makers may want to think about property taxes by excluding the lower values and when you take into consideration the huge increase in property values as per the central bank's index that in the western province or the Colombo district rather that over the last decade land value has gone up by 170 percent. Now, this is Colombo district not Colombo city which is a much wider area and over the last 5 years land prices have gone up 95 percent. So, there has been a significant enhancement in household wealth and there is a case that some portion of that enhancement be paid as property taxes. So, never understood as to why people do not like to pay taxes, because as per the law you only pay taxes above certain thresholds, which means that you are successful and it is the price we pay for a civilized society. Let us move on to the expenditure side. Although graph 1 shows you that it has been increasing related to GDP, the trend has been declining. And this shows you a composition of primary expenditure. So, we took out interest and we said, okay, how does the government spend? and the expenditure on goods and services are the majority of government expenditure and there is a sizable amount also in terms of transfers. So, this is a functional classification of primary expenditure and at the bottom the government service does absorb a fair amount of expenditure. We have a fairly large defense recurrent expenditure. It is estimated that if you take into account the police, the military, it is about 400,000 people who are serving the country. And then in terms of social service that we have about 220,000 teachers and about 100,000 healthcare workers. So, there is a there is a fair amount of expenditure into those social services. Now, this shows you capital expenditure and it is a sizable amount, but as a percentage of GDP it has been coming down. One has to assess the quality of expenditure, but purely on the headline number 
the trend has been coming down because it has always been the balancing number that when governments are under stress that they are facing significant fiscal headwinds, it is capital expenditure that is the easiest to cut. And where does this capital expenditure go? So, close to 60 percent is acquisition of capital assets. So, all the infrastructure that we see that has been developed in this country gets classified here. And the purple shows you a transfer to institutions. This is mainly transfers. So, although it is called capital expenditure, it is really recapitalizing some of the state entities that have run at losses. So, in other words, it is a form of household transfer, but it is getting classified under capital expenditure. And this shows you where these transfers are happening. So, the biggest capital expenditure has been going to transport and communication, which is basically all the highways that we are building in the country. And we have invested in energy and even in social infrastructure like schools and healthcare. So, when we dig in to primary expenditure and look at some of the recurrent trends, we spend about 650 billion on salaries and wages and a sizable amount something like 35 percent goes towards defense and police. So, the whole national security and safety apparatus costs us about 35 percent of the total wage bill. And there are about 1.4 million to 1.5 million people who work in the public sector. The public service it is about 1.3 million and the balance 200,000 works in the SOEs. And at the bottom shows you the real wage index of public service. And as you can see that post uh, 10,000 rupees a month salary increase, there was a significant increase in real wages of public servants. And when you compare it with private sector wage earners, actually the pu public sector when you take in their pension privileges and other fringe benefits, they are fairly well paid especially at the lower levels. So, this slide demonstrates our spending on social services relative to some peers and education which most Sri Lankan households take very seriously, the investment from the state has been declining and as a percentage of GDP over the years, it has significantly come down. In terms of health care, when we compare again relative to other peers, the spend has come down. Of course, we are not discussing the quality which is also debatable because the household surveys have shown that the richest households to the poorest households do spend a significant amount of out of pocket for tuition etcetera. And in terms of military, it is been 11 years since the end of the conflict and we are spending around 2 percent of GDP on the military. At the height of the conflict, the figure was a little bit in excess of 3 percent and when you can compare with regional peers, actually the spending relative to GDP is lower than them. The next highest expenditure is from pensions and the pensions uh, show an increasing trend. Of course, they are not always indexed, so it is arbitrarily increased at every budget. And then there are two, two drivers, one is the inflation of pensions of existing pensioners, the second is the number of pensioners and as the middle graph shows you the number of pensioners are increasing 
and the graph at the bottom shows you a demographic trend called the dependency ratio, which means that the number of people basically who are dependent on the economically active workforce. And the old age dependency ratio because of the demographic transition is expected to steadily go up. So, that component of pension now unlike many countries we do not have a national pension fund, the pension is only eligible for public servants that burden is expected to go up. This shows you what we are spending on cash transfers and subsidies. So, Samurdi is a form of cash transfers is costing us about 45 billion rupees a year relative to a total spend of 2.7 trillion of which 900 billion is interest in 2019. The Samurdi transfers are relatively a modest amount. We also spend on fertilizer which is about 35 billion and there are also lots of subsidies that are delivered through the state owned entities. So, for example, if you are at the lifeline rate and use less than 60 kilowatt hours 60 units which is a mere 2 units a day a very small number uh, your electricity cost is 2 rupees 50 for the first 30 units and thereafter 4 rupees 85 and if you are consuming slightly above 60 units you pay a slightly higher unit rate. But the highest households, highest consuming households above 180 units, they pay 45 rupees. So, if you do a comparison uh, between the highest tariff and the lowest tariff, that factor is almost like 15 times, which does not seem to make sense. And si similar pattern is there in water. So, very low utilization consumers relative to higher utilization consumers the unit rate is about 10 folds different. This again does not make sense. So, in summary when you look at how we transfer subsidies it would be lot better to price these utilities at their market price and increase the cash transfer component leaving the consumer the choice of how they want to spend their money. So, previously in the previous primer we discussed about the challenges in debt and this shows you that almost 50 percent of revenue is used to pay for interest and if you take debt servicing it is over 100 percent of revenue. Let us move on to the state owned entities. The left is the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation and in 2018 they made a 100 billion rupee loss. I will repeat that they made a 100 billion rupee loss. 20 billion was operation loss, 80 billion came from a revaluation of their dollar liabilities because there was a big depreciation in the currency. The Ceylon Electricity Board has been running at large losses. In 2018, their average cost per unit of electricity was about 19 rupees 30, and in 2019, their cost was about 23 rupees a unit and the average revenue per unit that they earn is about 16 rupees and that has not changed for the last 6 years because the last time we reset electricity rates was in 2014 and the amount of consumption has been going up and in 2019 about 15 billion units of electricity were sold. So, you do the maths on that that in any given year whether you lose 3 rupees or you lose 5 rupees it is 3 into 15 or 5 into 15 which generates these large losses. Then you have Sri Lankan airlines. It is well known that 
they are a distressed entity and pre covid they were generating large losses. Satosa which has over 400 stores around the country, they do not run at a profit. They are also losing money because they are a highly subsidized items that are sold from the store which are below the cost price. And this shows you the top 52 SOEs, the profitability. And in 2019, the red shows you the large losses, again the same culprits, Electricity Board, Ceylon Petroleum Corporation, Sri Lankan Airlines. And then there is some of the uh, SOEs are profitable like the banks. That is because basically the Basel rules allow them to operate with much lower levels of capital relative to the private banks. So, what can we do about this? That is called the process of fiscal consolidation and what measures we can take to control borrowing. So, there are four drivers. We have to first think about the size of the adjustment, the pace and duration of the adjustment, the composition of the adjustment and how durable is it. So, what is fiscal consolidation? It denotes budgetary measures taken by the government to improve its fiscal position and reduce debt to GDP. Measures taken by the budget to enhance revenue and curtail expenditure, discretionary automatic improvements in the fiscal position due to favorable conditions, example a commodity boom is not fiscal consolidation. So, what are the types of fiscal consolidation that one can use? Before we get into that, I am revisiting the problem that Sri Lanka mainly is a revenue issue. So, how big should the adjustment be? Well, one, one issue with fiscal adjustment is that the government also has something called absorption which is government consumption plus investment. And if you reduce that, you reduce aggregate demand which means that in the short term it is negative on GDP growth. And when GDP growth comes down, the amount of taxes that you can collect also comes down. So, if consolidation is done in a highly weakened economy like the shock that we are facing at the moment, it will make things even worse. It also depends on the duration over which you do fiscal consolidation, whether you front load the difficult things generally it is done in the early years of a government because they have the benefit of a strong mandate rather than backload it. And whether you can stagger it over a period of time so that the impact, the distortionary impact from higher taxes can be reduced. And then there is also adjustment fatigue that if you, if you continuously have to consolidate and hold back government spending or get the population to pay higher taxes, especially in a situation like in Sri Lanka where our population has not been used to, to paying taxes, you are going to lose a lot of political capital in doing that. So, it also depends on the composition of the adjustment, whether you focus on quick fixes or you increase taxes or you lower expenditure. And between the two expenditure multipliers versus revenue multipliers, generally expenditure multipliers especially capital in investment has a high multiplier effect. And revenue multipliers are generally considered lower and the least distortionary taxation measure is wealth taxes. 
Now, Sri Lanka does not have any wealth taxes. We did have once upon a time, a few decades ago. The durability of fiscal consolidation is also going to depend on the commitment of the government in power and it is, it is more durable if it is done through structural reform and that one debates what the role of government is and that you push for more efficiency and more private sector improvements. And lastly, the question we are asking is should we have constitutional safeguards to control over borrowing, fiscal rules. In the European Union, countries, member countries unless for exceptional reasons cannot exceed 3 percent of GDP as their deficit. Should you have budgetary institutions like a budgetary office? These two points will be further discussed in the panel discussion. So, on that note, I conclude the second primer and I will see you in the third primer which will deal with the issue of economic growth and whether Sri Lanka can grow out of its current debt problem.